So thank you all for coming. This is an amazing turnout. So um, I'm uh, very excited uh, that uh, all of you are here. Um, so thank you for joining us for this uh, first, the first day of the conference. Um, this is an inaugural presentation of the photographic universe. Um, I'm Arthur O, oh, the director of the BFA photo program at uh, uh, Parsons and New School for Design. Um, it's uh, exciting to see the tremendous uh, uh, turnout and interest in this uh, event. It's, it shows that the subject of photography is one that many of us from so many varied backgrounds uh, are thinking about. This inaugural event is the first of what will become a biennial series uh, occurring every two years. Um, because two years from now, photography will, I can say you know, with a lot of confidence that uh, it will be in a very different place. Um, as most of you will agree, the field of photography is constantly changing. Uh, technologies, theories, and what constitute a photographer and, or a photograph are prone to constant reevaluation. Re Over the past two decades, we have seen the definition of uh, photography expand and transform due to the digital revolution and the growth of the internet and the accelerated um, stream of interest in new photographic processes and uh, applications. The photographic medium seems to be in a similar place to where uh, it was during the first few decades of its invention, uh, where rapid changes uh, and innovations in technology accelerated its impact on culture. The considerable interest in this conference is proof that um, how timely it is uh, to reflect on this moment, uh, to think about the importance of photography as a specific medium and as a discipline, and to draw ideas and raise uh, questions from the perspective of artists, photographer, educator, technologist, scientist, historian, and uh, many others. The format of today's uh, discussion will consist of one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations between individuals from different professional and research backgrounds. Uh, each speaker will present a 10-minute uh, presentation on photography, followed by a 20-minute dialogue responding to each other's presentations. And then we'll have a, a short time for questions from the audience. Um, today's discussion on photography will focus on topics surrounding art and philosophy. It is with uh, great pleasure and honor that I welcome our dis distinguished guests for today. Uh, Chris Boot, Charlotte Cotton, Andrea Geyer, Anne Collins Goodyear, Susie Linfield, Walter Ben Michaels, uh, Susan Mizellis, David Reinford, James Welling, and Penelope Umbreco uh, to lead the this, uh, conversations today. Uh, to maximize on our time, uh, each speaker will be introduced by their names only. Um, their bios will be projected on the, the east wall, um, and full bios could be found uh, in the programs that you have in your hands. Um, I'd like to thank the people who um, are involved in the organize, organizing of this event, without whose help this uh, would not be possible. I'd like to thank uh, Leslie Martin and Christina Caputo from the Aperture Foundation, um, Karen Quoney and Annie Shaw from the Vera List Center for Art and Politics, um, Ro Romy Michalinski from the Spellman Institute of Photography, um, Pam Tillis from the New School, uh, my colleagues uh, Janine Olson, George Pitts, Thomas Warner, and James uh, Raymer in the uh, photography program. Um, so thank you all for coming, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you, um, you know, during the breaks and the lunch. Um, thank you. Good morning. I'm Christina Caputo, and on behalf of Aperture Foundation, we're very honored to be here and uh, co-sponsor and part of this uh, wonderful event and hopefully uh, the first of an ongoing dialogue. Um, founded in 1952, Aperture is a world-renowned publisher and exhibition space to dedicated to promoting photography. We're a nonprofit foundation, and our programs include artist lectures and panel discussions, limited edition photographs, and traveling exhibitions. Please do visit the table outside the auditorium uh, for a special subscription rate on our magazine and sign up for our newsletter to find out about more events like these and also um, some, of our, some of the books available um, from, from the participating speakers will also um, be on sale 
and do visit our gallery and bookstore in Chelsea. Um, currently on view is an exhibition titled Regeneration to Tomorrow's Photographers Today, um, which includes some Parsons students as well. Um, a special thanks to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for generously supporting our programming and um, the Spielman Institute for Photography and particularly, of course, the New School. Um, along with all the people Arthur thanked, I would like to give a special thanks to Arthur O oh for bringing this idea to the table and making it come to life. So thank you and enjoy the two days and um, hope to see you in the future. Hi, good morning and thank you everybody for coming t today. I'm looking forward to the fascinating conversations uh, that we're going to hear and I truly hope that this is only the first time that those three or four amazing bodies are um, gathering and that um, we at the Spielman Institute will be able to join forces. Um, so, um, the Spielman Institute was founded in Tel Aviv just about a year ago. We are a research institute doing our first steps into research and into collaborations between both uh, practitioners, curators, theoreticians, and um, photo enthusiasts. We have um, produced several events that deepen the understanding of photography in Israel, including international guests, be they curators such as Peter Galassi, Marta Gili, um, Julian Heinan, and others, and um, translated several texts into Hebrew. However, we have just launched um, our research program, our call for papers, the deadline was yesterday, and we're very pleased to have um, an amount of over 500 applications received from all over the world, from many practitioners and um, theorists in, in um, inquiring into photography from many different angles, from many different disciplines. Um, we're looking not only into deepening the understanding of photography, but also into creating collaborations and some kind of an international hive of um, all those people interested in photography, be it from practice or from research angles. We're looking into creating researchers' networks as well as um, groups of people working and um, experimenting together. And um, in about a month from now, we will announce the winners of the first grant program and we'll probably announce the next call for research and um, also for projects, be they art books or dissemination events just like this one. Um, please visit our website for additional information. And I'd like to also um, to thank Arthur in person, as well as the other friends um, from um, Aperture, the Realist Center, Parsons the New School, and to thank everybody for coming today. Thank you very much. So I'd like to welcome Charlotte Cotton and David Reinford for the first session. <laughs> um, in preparation for our, our 10 minute uh, papers each, uh, Arthur sent us some questions, um, which has kind of prompted us to frame our, our little speeches. Um, they're both specific. I mean, Arthur was asking us to talk a bit about Words Without Pictures, which was a web and live event and eventually an aperture book that David and I worked on together. Um, but also really a frame around this idea of the shifting constellation around photography of photography at the moment. And Arthur's questions to me made me think, when was it that that, that feeling that things were really changing kicked in for me? And it was definitely in the mid-2000s. 
And it was where the axis, which I had developed professionally, which was around con photography as contemporary art, suddenly didn't feel the most useful axis for me. I mean, it's understandable that that would have been my access. You know, I began a career as a curator in 1992, and that was really the point, I guess, when that sort of resilient sense of photography as an international contemporary art form really kicked off. I mean, why wouldn't I have been looking at that? And I got to do that in a, you know, a very um, pluralistic environment of uh, Art and Design Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum. So <clears throat> it never felt like I was dealing with a very narrow definition of photography. It was still photography as art, but within its very sort of traditionally pluralistic framework. Um, in the early 2000s, I wrote a book for Thames and Hudson called The Photographer's Contemporary Art. And the book came out in, I think, sort of 2004. And that was a moment where it was really pretty obvious that, I mean, I didn't realize this at, before the book came out, but when it came out, that photography as contemporary art was a subject. And I, don't, and I think I didn't realize that I hadn't really signed up to dealing with a subject like an art historical subject, this thing called photography as contemporary art. I'd just been really enjoying this quite sort of dynamic ride through the 90s and early 2000s. And um, I also felt very uncomfortable about the idea that my writing would be set something that felt very set in stone. It became, that book very much became like a sort of industry standard. And I get invited to do book signings in art fairs. And, you know, people would say, oh, so-and-so, they're in your book. And, um, you know, as somebody who is actually really deeply mercurial, I would really felt very resistant to being sort of somebody that people would assume that they knew what I liked or what what I was interested in. Um, anyway, uh, I, I think the other thing that was worrying me was more around um, the fact that digitization and this idea of digital photography was going th by the mid 2000s. I think a lot of the sort of promises or the excitement of it or anticipation of what that might mean for photography as contemporary art really didn't feel like it was lived out yet. And it seemed that um, whereas one could see that within creative industries and commercial practice, digitization was being talked about in uh, a way that was actually about profound changes. It didn't seem that there, there were particularly profound changes happening within <coughs> contemporary art photography and that digital seemed to be represented by light jets or lambda prints, so actually just to be a process. Um, or it meant that photographers ha had to have websites in order to exist. And there were some really, the, there were some good, but there were also a lot of very misguided projects where the art world was trying to appropriate and critique this increasing sort of dynamic of digital image making and online culture in ways that didn't really seem to analyze you know, digital culture, nor, in, nor indeed seem to um, uh, really sort of flesh out what contemporary art, could, contemporary art photography could be in a digital era. And there were also some really lousy sort of museum shows of sort of citizen photography or flicker, often in the education spaces as well. So it was like museums weren't able yet to respond to photography in a digital era either. Um, in the mid-2000s, I moved to New York, and for many people that was um, career suicide because I went to work in the commercial sector. But um, to be honest, somebody like me with no postgraduate wasn't going to get a job in uh, another museum in the US. And nor did I actually think that was what, what I wanted to do because, because of these beginnings of feelings that the subject was, you know, of photography as contemporary art as it's experienced in museums was something that was becoming a bit too solid for, for my liking. Actually, the commercial world gave me a lot of freedom. It meant when I wrote, when I taught, when I had discussions about the future of photography, it was really for me. And, of course, I learned who my friends were, which included... Um, David Reinfurt. Um, it was in New York that the idea for Words Without Pictures really began to take form. 
And in part, that was about, you know, I was feeling, um, you know, the project was one which was about having discussions about emergent issues before they become received wisdom within photography as a way of sort of in, with a light, uh, light touch to create an earnest forum for the discussions I guess we were all having in bars or at dinner or, you know, in studios around what the future might bring for photography and how we're going to define it. Um, so I like the idea of a project which was from the get-go about creating something that was a lot less definite, that allowed you, allowed you to propose something that was a new idea to you, but also to change your mind during the course of the project. Um, I like the idea of being able to engage with online culture. You know, I'm not of a generation that sort of naturally goes that way. So the idea of creating a project where... Um, Actually, online made sense to me. It didn't feel like I was just being a teenager or something. It was really, really important in the way that you design the project. Um, and I felt that conversation was just a better way of understanding this moment than write, you know, tucking myself away and writing or creating exhibitions. Um, I then moved to LA in 2007 and um, that's when Words Without Pictures really took form and I was working at LA County Museum. But I think it, was, it wasn't so much that I was working in a museum again that made Words Without Pictures happen. It was actually the nature of the photographic and the artistic community in Los Angeles, which I found immensely discursive. I guess because the critical mass is much more an art school critical mass than an arts institution critical mass. And so one of the first debates that we did for Words Without Pictures, I remember it was in a small auditorium at LACMA, and um, I mean, you literally had, I think Jim Welling was there, and uh, you know, young filmmakers, great artists, as well as a couple of Mr. Ansel Adams. And the, there was a sense that actually none of us were, had a more privileged understanding of this moment than any others. And we had this really amazing debate. I remember coming out and sort of sitting in my car and crying with joy. It was such a sort of amazing sort of turning point. It was also um, an amazing feeling to have created, created an event in an institution where it was accepted that the institution didn't have the answer to those questions that we were asking as well, which was, you know, a legitimate stance for a museum that had had a very moribund photographic department um, for a couple of years, that actually it was its gesture and its greatest contribution to LA culture was really to create a place where, a, you know, the really important discussion around photography could happen rather than any exhibition or anything else. Um, I was lured away from LA um, uh, in 2009, uh, really because I got another chance to change my axis, because all of my experience of being with photography up until uh, 2009 had been within arts organisations. I think I've, I've done a really good job not to carry the baggage of trying to legitimise photography as an art form, as the, as the only discourse that's worth having around photography in museums. But still, I think the fact that I'd always worked in arts organisations rather than now where I work in a science museum meant that the, that was ultimately the big question that everyone asks. Yeah, but is it art or not? Um, so I moved in 2009 back to London and, uh, to work on a project which, um, if we raise the money, will open in next year, September 2012, called Media Space. Um, and it's a partnership between the Science Museum and the National Media Museum. And um, I'm really enjoying this new axis. Obviously, a science museum really isn't that bothered about whether it's art or not. It's all creative, and it's very happy to take on board photography and media as creative technologies, whether they're produced by artists or amateurs or specialists and professionals. And it seemed like it was the right home, the right place, to ask some really fundamental questions around photography within this umbrella of media, which is things like, how will the creative industries reform in the next year, next 10 years? Where will the creativity reside within creative technologies? Who will create? Will they think in totally different ways from us? Um, us being people who extreme, you know, may have got to grips with digital, but essentially we're extremely platform sensitive. Um, 
And for a museum um, wanting to address photography beyond the sort of increasingly specific field of contemporary art photography, this also felt like the perfect subject and the play perfect place to have um, a museological discussion which is triggered by the state of photography and the state of media. So it can, I, I'm with the space, I think we can ask questions like, how do you narrate a mixed, changing, non-linear moment in f photography's broad terrain? If you think that uh, museums in the 19th and 20th century were still dealing with linear narratives, the history of, I mean, one of the great things about opening a space now with photography at its centre, rather than, say, 10 years ago, is, is I think this, the pressure would have still been on to create a discrete history of photography. Whereas, of course, that seems totally laughable to, um, to try and create a discrete history of any medium uh, or mediums. Um, another question I think um, we're asking, you know, prompted by the Media Space Project is, you know, what, what, are, we, what are we actually um, offering? What are we providing for young people? So sort of, purely, you know, purely digital generation. What can we teach them? I mean, again, it's laughable to think of a museum providing media skills to 12-year-olds, seeing as they understand the landscape much better than us. So our relationship with um, an audience is shifted by digital culture. What does it actually mean to commit to come into physical space, cultural space? What can you not do online or in different ways within a digital culture? What's so special about coming together? How does a museum frame that? Um, I suppose another question that we're asking is, has photography become a heritage industry? I think the answer, hopefully, is no. <laughs> um, and are we OK with that? And then another um, question that I think uh, media asks of museums is what are the meaningful roles for a museum in the lives of image makers? Is it exhibitions or is it more about creating a community? And I can see a red light going <laughs> off, yep. <laughs> okay, great. Um, shall, I, shall I go up to the, I have slides. How will this work? I have four slides. Shall I turn them or should I sit here and somebody else turns them? I can turn them. Okay. Right. Are you just going to tell me when to turn yeah, this Yeah, okay. that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. Um, so Charlotte got on to the idea of photography as a kind of accidental subject, at least. Um, yeah. I mean, not to put too many words into your mouth, but um, uh, it's got a lot, I have a lot more distance from it than that. It's not a subject at all for me. I'm a graphic designer, trained as a graphic designer. Practice it such, um, although maybe incorporate a fairly broad um, definition of that into my practice. So today, I wanted for this ten minutes, I wanted to share an anecdote, and it's an anecdote that's um, that's two times removed, so it may have some uh, slight untruths in it, but not on purpose. <laughs> um, so, and it's an anecdote, kind of loosely. I mean, it's to do with photography, anyway, and I think it may launch us somewhere. Okay, that's a color wheel um, behind me. Um, this is a story that, that I heard from, I worked together with Stuart Bailey, who's uh, my partner in Dexter Sinister here in New York. Uh, Stuart lives in Los Angeles. Um, Stuart told me this story from uh, which he was told by his, uh, his girlfriend, Frances Stark, who is teaching at the University of Southern California in the MFA program. There. Now, Francis, a number of years ago, was asked to teach a class, an undergraduate class in graphic design at USC. This is, I think, leading up towards, um, towards her uh, tenure. And she was asked to teach this class. She realized about as soon as she started to deal with what to teach that she, first of all, never had a training in graphic design, um, never practiced it, nor had any particularly meaningful relationship to it. Uh, she was given the syllabus from this course as it existed before. Another, uh, somebody else had been teaching in the past. They, of course, had a fairly developed syllabus, the course that existed in the program for a while. She started to look through this syllabus, and she realized that it was organized around a series of, um, of, uh, of kind of uh, theoretical models, such as the color wheel. Um, 
as a way, as a kind of introduction into graphic design and, and a bit as a kind of foundation design art course. Uh, and she thought, she was, she questioned whether learning these uh, fundamental and more abstract uh, models still made sense today. Um, can, can you turn to the next slide, actually? Okay. She recognized the, the curriculum as kind of a warmed over Bauhaus methodology. And of course, um, if particularly within design, uh, the Bauhaus casts its shadow uh, today and, and particularly in, in teaching. Now, I think we probably, many of us know that Bauhaus was organized around a series of workshops. Um, it was a medium specific training. Uh, and you enrolled yourself after the foundations course, you enrolled yourself within one of these workshops where you were both hands-on making the work that you're engaged in and uh, as well talking about it and thinking about it. And um, this is a picture of the wall painting workshop at the Bauhaus. Um, I'm not sure which version this is. I forget uh, which, which instantiation of the Bauhaus this workshop is in. I forget this. Um, it was black and white, of course, the, the point of the wall painting workshop was its color. Um, the wall painting workshop is of particular interest to me because it has a uh, uh, more complicated relationship to the school. The wall painting workshop, students enrolled in the Bauhaus wall painting workshop were developing color schemes and kind of new techniques, new technologies, new chemistries. And those, what they were discovering were applied back to the school itself. They were painting the school. Right, and this is quite different than, say, the printing workshop, although that was, again, pushed back into the surface of the school, but it certainly was different than the metal workshop or uh, ceramics or other places where they were making works that existed outside of the school. Here, here they were making uh, painting schemes and um, uh, color relationships, et cetera, that were painted back into the school. I guess famously, some of the ceilings in the master's houses at the Bauhaus were painted black. Um, I've never actually been in a room with a black ceiling, but I imagine it's fairly, uh, uh, has a fairly visceral effect. Uh, so let's go to the next side, please. There are four slides. So this is a drawing by, a diagram by Johannes Itten from the first iteration of the Bauhaus, um, which describes the Bauhaus um, core curriculum and the way in which it was organized. And I bring this up for the shape of the diagram primarily. And you'll see around the outside, it works from the outside in, um, peeling an onion, whatever metaphor you'd like to apply in there. Uh, begins with the foundations course around the outside of this set of rings. You Students are enrolled in the foundations course, uh, learn a bit about many different mediums, and then proceed to choose a, um, a workshop in which to enroll themselves and to study uh, and become a mat, or uh, anyway, develop a facility within that particular medium as they work their way towards the center. Uh, you'll see arranged glass, metal, etc. Um, some of the workshops they could enroll in. Now it occurs to me that this, that this uh, well as Frances was describing her experience in, in beginning to teach this design class and being uh, faced with a kind of hangover from a Bauhaus uh, pedagogy and a medium specific way of teaching graphic design which uh, which particularly has no medium to speak of. Um, she just thought there is a real uh, disconnect here. And she suggested that you could reimagine the Bauhaus, um, the Bauhaus pedagogy through the Photoshop toolbox. The next slide. So she thought, well, maybe a better way to teach this class is just to simply go sit up here in front of uh, Photoshop, let's say and to click through the tools. And maybe that would be a more uh, productive way to organize teaching a kind of foundation design course to a group of students who are just uh, indoctrinating, you know, who are just uh, welcoming themselves into this, into this course of study. Now this is a kind of absurd idea, but I thought it was, it was very evocative um, to me and to Stuart as well. The idea of reconsidering a foundations course through this kind of silly um, toolbar. Um, now, I, I call attention between this, this organization, the way this diagram looks, and the way the Bauhaus, and the way Itten's 
diagram of, of Bauhaus pedagogy looked, right? It was an onion working your way down towards the center, a core of knowledge. This is a non-hierarchical relationship. In fact, you look at the toolbars, it changes over time. I mean, this is an old one. I picked it because it has a little distance. It's kind of nicer to see, not for its, not for its nostalgia. Um, I also think it's just simply uh, more precise, this one. Um, or a more limited collection. But anyway, these, these set of tools do nothing but expand. Photoshop with new, each new uh, release does nothing but add tools. But the strange thing about these tools is they're, I mean, they're, they're called tools, and obviously that's a grand metaphor itself. But the paintbrush tool works very, very much like the rubber stamp tool, which, which, very, which works very, very much like the blur tool, right? These things are almost indistinguishable. And in fact, all they're doing is kind of taking the pixels in your, in your file and rearranging them, right? The twirl tool, the, the, how about the history tool, which is kind of a wonderful thing. You just step back in time as if a tool allowed you to do that. Or the airbrush tool. So it'd be absurd to teach a kind of medium-specific course around, around, this set of, um, around this set of tools because uh, can you imagine sitting down and teaching somebody to use the Photoshop airbrush tool correctly? I'm not saying there isn't a, a whole... Um, uh, degree of mastery that you can learn yourself into here, but it would be difficult to uh, teach a foundations course that uh, that was focused around a kind of developing a facility with any one of these tools. So it occurred to me that this kind of non-hierarchical relationship, as opposed to the Bauhaus's um, uh, outside-in model, is a is a useful way to think about teaching media in general right now. Um, the, there is one, one further, one important part about, the, about these set of tools is they, if they work basically as effects. You click a tool, it does its job. There's no, there's no sense in teaching it because all you have to do is, is you try it and you see what results. And in fact, uh, you're kind of, it's, it ends up being more of an exercise in kind of a forensic, a f some sort of forensic exercise. You're trying to figure out what you just did. And the history tool becomes really important in that way. And I, I think this is a real, you know, in a, in a field such as photography, let's say, but media more generally, that's changing absolutely so rapidly, it seems like this is the exercise. It's not an exercise in, in uh, shoring up its boundaries or doing it. And I think Charlotte, yeah. lots of Charlotte's projects have, have gone this way in my, in my experience with her. It's not about shoring up the boundaries, of course, but it is about trying to understand something by, more by doing it than by uh, developing a core set of techniques around it. And I think I just got the red light, so I might stop right here. Um, can, David, can I ask you a question to, to kick off our discussions? Um, uh, you do more teaching than I do. Yes. But, I mean, how do you teach something that is changing? Because it seems that you're talking, I mean, you're talking about design, but I'm yeah. obviously photo obsessed, yeah. so I'm hearing photography and applying everything you're saying to, mm -hmm. to photography yeah. also. How do you teach it? What, or what's the relationship between teaching institution and teacher and students in this new, dawning of a new era? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I can only talk from my personal experience and I don't, you know, because I'm, given this podium, it sounds like I'm uh, making broader statements than I really intend to. So in my, in my personal experience, uh, I set out to teach in a way so that we're all doing something together, and this this happens because I'm always teaching in a studio situation. So, yeah, I've never taught or had any relationship into photography per se, but uh, but I think as soon as the relationship between the student and the person making it is much more equivalent, and you're figuring out as you work along, then this is useful, and especially something changing so quickly. I say I have taught. Uh, interactive media before, or interactive media design, or these kinds of courses before. And truth is, it, it becomes very clear that I know less than many of the students in there. Um, but that's, that's of course fine. Uh, but when you, when you initiate it as a communal activity and everybody's kind of putting in their little bit to do something together rather than developing their own, their own skills, I think that's one way to do it. Right, yeah. right. Um, and do you think that, um, I mean, do you think that Words Without Pictures, was that f for you what appealed to you yeah. about that? Yeah, actually, yeah, great. I, I think talking about Words Without Pictures is a, is a very useful way to, to understand this. 
because uh, what I was struck by is exactly what what you were describing, which was you didn't in in starting the project you had no idea where you wanted it to go. No. No. And actually, I'd just back up for one second to say that it was organized around a set of 12 essays that you were commissioning and a series of live events and a website which released those essays one by one over the course of the 12 months. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I guess in Words Without Pictures, uh, m my experience with it, uh, designing the materials that went along with it, is that... Uh, is that it gathered... A, it was like a ball that gathered that gathered people around it. Yeah. So it didn't clearly say what it was out to do other than it was it was out to um, start a conversation. And like any conversation, it actually accumulated people who either listened or directly participated or were invited to participate yeah. as it went. And somehow I think that also that collective part of it struck me. And, and you were saying in Los Angeles that, I mean, it, the couple events which I, which I was happy to attend, uh, I was also amazed by the kind of committed core community that seemed to yeah. be at both those things and who are participating in the site and yeah. and uh, were actively engaged in talking about it. I mean, it, it, it feels like, I mean, it hit the mark in terms of it was terrifically earnest project. Yeah. And um, and it was, it was actually, it was, I mean, I enjoyed it because it was, uh, I've often worked in situations where expectations are super low, either expectations of the time or expectations mm. of the institution and that often means that you can kind of um i mean there could there were a gazillion things latma could have should have been doing yeah, for yeah, yeah. 15 years and it hadn't and um so it could just leapfrog over it and um set a very different set a different proposition make a proposition rather than make a statement and also to um, create a very different, a very quite humanized relationship if it wasn't treating its um, users as audience, mm -hmm. which um, obviously is, you know, those some, it feels like a, it's a very semantic moment within museums, I must say, mm. which is who does the inviting, when is it right. about okay. audience, when is it user, when is it contributor? And Words Without Pictures in a very... It, um, as you say, in a way that wasn't really worked out, was this, well, let's find out who wants to become a contributor, right, of which, right. you know, 80 people did, right. and um, who wants to be a user, of which, you know, 400 a day. But And, and then, it, you know, it was actually, it was terribly niche, but it, yeah. was, it was very genuine, and it was people who had a vested interest in it. Well, yeah, you... you Mentioned you mentioned a couple of times doing that kind of project within an institutional frame was difficult because of the the distinctions between as you're saying between the users between the audience and the people who are participating and the people yeah. who are invited to participate and those who just kind of initiate themselves yeah and who's the it. specialist yeah yeah right I'm wondering I I have a I have a question back to you around that words without pictures uh, worked just as the title says, which it was a set of uh, essays and conversations and discussions about photography and no photography, right? Absolutely no photography. Yeah, no pictures, yeah. yeah. No pictures. And so I'm just wondering, did that help? Did that help it kind of fly under the radar institutionally? Do you think there is any, yeah. like the kind of channel, re-channeling right. of one discussion into another medium? Right. Uh, did that help? I mean, what did that do to the project or? or? Um, well, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about how it helped. I mean, I just yeah. knew that I absolutely didn't want that because what I, I mean, one of the founding things about Words Without Pictures was it had to be different from the way that blogs and photo websites were functioning. Um, I mean, there was a point in the mid two thousands where there was there was one blog in particular which was um, the blog of a, a really well respected, famous, and great photographer. And I think at the time the debate was about whether it was possible to be a great father as well as a great photographer. And I was just like, for fuck's sake, if this is going <laughs> to be the record of what we discussed at this key moment in photography so I, I just didn't want it to become congratulatory and so yeah. by taking out the pictures there was just there was no prize right, right. <laughs> I mean it was really about the issues at hand each month did it I mean did it often went often if uh, often if you're taken out of your kind of uh, specialized field yeah. then you you're given a lot of leeway 
because you're an interloper or whatever. I think, I think you think give that. yourself the leeway and work yeah. without pictures yeah. as a framework gave permission and yeah. there was no retribution. Mm. I mean, the, mm. the ask was the ask that um, um, was about being intelligent rather than being academic or institutionalized mm. in the way that you said something. So, you know, yeah. some of the essays were artists who are writing their first essay or it was academics, but asking them to write without footnotes right, and to write right, on the right. fly. Um, and mm -hmm. and I like that. And when I was um, very early on, when I was at the V&A, so in the early 90s, when it was the beleaguered V&A, like it yeah. couldn't do anything right. So it was a perfect place yeah, yeah. to work. You know, if you could raise 50 cents, you could do literally anything because <laughs> they were so desperate for an audience. So. Um, and there was like one of the big all staff meetings where we were all sort of piled into the lecture theatre and, you know, different experts were getting up defending their bit of territory, whether that's, which is lovely at the V&A because it's like it's anything from medals right, to, right. you know, <laughs> brasses to ceramics, etc. Yeah. So they were getting up in these sort of hubristic ways as specialists and talking yeah, about, yeah. you know, of course we must exist and all of this. And then this intern got up and she said, look, the thing is, is, is that this institution has to understand the difference between being academic and being intelligent. And our job is to be intelligent. And I have, I mean, you can mm, tell I've yeah. never forgotten right. that at all. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the, and it's the nature of the time that we live through. I mean, hurrah, none of us are specialists in right, this because right. we're living it. And right. We just have to be intelligent about it. True. And that's the, that's the most difficult part, right, to try to, understand something that you're going through while you're going through it which is um i mean you 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 want to develop some sort of kind of critical uh apparatus to be able to see what you're doing while you're doing it right um i mean i wonder you you know i know words without pictures was set up as a 12 month process okay and yeah. and the whole thing was was also couched i mean it was monthly it was serial the events happened in the same way the uh respondents to the essays happened at a certain time and were posted on the website yeah um so so that unfolds i mean that was staged as a process and it unfolds as a process and you understand it as such and that we chose not to archive the old pieces on the website they were no longer available you tuned in for that month or you did not tune in to that one you yeah. continued to the next so all those choices seem to kind of amplify its its uh, processness, and then you also you just mentioned kind of offhanded when you were when you were giving your ten minutes, you described digital as a process, right? And I wonder whether there's, I mean, I, I, wasn't I even wonder aware that I did that. <laughs> yeah, well, you said digital as a process in terms of lambda prints or this, that, or the other, right. that being what um what identifies it. And when I was doing my ten minutes, I also described when you, you know. Uh, use a Photoshop tool. It's a matter of just doing it and then you kind of uncover mm. what you've done rather than a kind of calculated um, choice of how you do it. And of course, there are a million ways to do the same thing. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that, I'm wondering why it was important to stage that project as a, as a stage, like to be explicit about its stagedness. Was that, did you have a, um, why do that? Because I, I don't, I, because it was, it wasn't default online activity yeah it was against mm. it was sort of trying to be counter to it or to make another proposition mm. for it so it had to be sort of staged mm -hmm. i mean i kind of i'm resistant to describing that as curating because you know it, getting to the point where you could say you curated lunch i mean it's <laughs> you can create e curate everything but um i think there's um i think it was really important that those um sets of guidelines for how to behave yeah. were really explicit within that. And, and as I say, it's about not being default. There's working on, we're working on the physical design of the media space at the moment. And some of the most, co the conversations that I love the most, like I'm going around the space, it's a big space, and I'm going around with lots of different people, practitioners, whether they're musicians or TV production or artists or publishers, you know, loads of people giving their perspective on the space and how the space needs to work. And um, at the same time, I go around with, um, the sort of the stakeholders, as they're called, within the institutions who, you know, have that sort of institutional knowledge about how to make a space digitally 
kind of workable or lighting or environmentals and all of that. And um, they're actually the hardest conversations because inst the institution hasn't got used to the difference between default and what I'm calling sort of fet fetishized use of media. So there was this, this conversation last week which sort of ended in a row and then we all agreed to disagree, which was, um, you know, I want in the front space, I want it possible to do sort of uh, discussion, things like this. So you mm -hmm. need a projector, right? Mm -hmm. And a screen. And um, the ceilings are really high, and so they were saying, well, you know, we can have this kind of grid, light grid, and then you can have the, the projector drop down. And I was really unhappy with that, and I was finding it difficult to explain why I didn't want to see the projector. And it boiled down to this thing, which is, so, for some things, you don't care about the, the, mach the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to see the projector because I'm only interested in the projection. Mm -hmm. It's default, so it has to be a default technology. But if this was a Tasta Dean film, obviously I want to see the projector and hear the sound and mm -hmm. smell it and mm -hmm. all of that, and that's a fetishized use of media. And so... Um, I kind of feel that Words Without Pictures was, for me, like that, that that's why I got so sort of anal about all of mm, those sort of mm. s little rules, which right, was right. actually, it's not default. It wasn't right. a default use of online space. It was actually a very fetishized Precise, use. Yeah. 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 Well, I think I find it interesting the way that staged as a process and whether that, I mean, that certainly kind of differentiates itself from the way that some other things evolve online. And you're saying that's the, that's the intent. Um, yeah. I wonder if, I think it might be useful to have you describe media space right. a bit more and what, uh, where it exists now and what the ideas are for how it will manifest itself publicly. Um, I'll have a go. Okay. I mean, I'm at that. It's, it's just like it's it's at that sort Sorry. of non-literal stage yeah. where you'll just go, ah, no, it's not. It doesn't sound that interesting or coherent. <laughs> but the basic proposition is that it's a space which we're designing and kitting out to function for ten years. So it's a ten-year mm -hmm. project. Again, me mm -hmm. sort of saying, no, don't let yeah. this <laughs> malinger around yeah. for thirty years. It will only make sense. And um, 2012, which is when the space is due to open, is, um, for those of you who don't know, is the, is, um, the Olympics are in London. <laughs> and um, because I was living in the States, I was like, I just don't care about the Olympics until right. I get back. And then everyone's talking about the cultural Olympiad. And I'm like, what the hell is that? Sport? I don't know. But, um, of course, what it is, is it's the moment that the digital switch gets flicked. It's like what the coronation did for TV in homes. Mm. Mm in the UK, so it's it's a moment where actually the cultural legacy is about me a media legacy, basically. And um, so we're kicking off, we're opening the space with the debates of the Cultural Olympiad about the legacy of the Cultural Olympiad, and put essentially, essentially sort of putting a ball into motion which will last 10 years, which says the jury is out, who's going to make it, how will the creative industries reform, how will they make money, where is the creativity? All of those things, all of those questions are the questions that we're all asking, whether we're an institution, whether we're a 12-year-old, whether we're a m big media corporation. So media space is essentially the host for all the discussions, all the things we want to beta test in that 10-year period. And if we get the digital infrastructure right, we will be recording and archiving all of the things that we thought mm -hmm. within that time with an uh, with a just an acknowledgement from the get go that what we talk about in 2012 may be entirely different to where we get to by 2018 mm -hmm. and that this idea of setting off on a journey where the disc the f the primary questions are not is it art or not? Because, of course, photography and film and new media have all sort of gone along that channel of being, well, essentially validated into high culture by mm -hmm. cultural institutions. And, of course, the, lo the lovely thing about being in a science museum is nobody's expecting us to right. ask those questions, and actually they're not the most important questions in the next 10 years of media. There's, um, I was interested with your wheel, your Bauhaus yeah, wheel. Yeah. It was making me think of another wheel, which is in this essay written by a British academic at the Courtauld called Julian Stalabras, who writes a lot about contemporary art and photography. And he wrote an essay in the early 90s called 60 Billion Sunsets. So it was just at the point when digital was taking off, mm -hmm. but you know, an essay that really needs 
reads, I'd love him to write it again because yeah. it'd be a completely different proposition. But he does a wheel, and yeah. um, on the wheel is amateur, snapper, professional, and artist. Mm. It's a bit like that sort of Eddie Izzard wheel of fashion where yeah. it's like, you know, sort of ordinary, quite cool, really cool, really geeky. Yeah. You know, they're very close <laughs> right, together. Right. Yeah. So, you know, like... Um, uh, sort of artist and snapper at some yeah, points yeah. are very, very close yeah. together. Um, and, you know, it was written in a period where we were just about to have artists at the, being the axis of that wheel and photography as contemporary art as that axis. And I don't think that is the axis for the right, next 10 right. years. I mean, in a way, I mean, it's not that I've lost entire interest in what photography as contemporary art is. I just think it's probably the most stable mm -hmm. bit of mm -hmm. photography is this broad terrain. And I'm only interested in that in relation to the 27 billion photographs that get produced a year, of which, you know, obviously a point naught 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 one percent is photography as contemporary art. Right. In the media space, there'll also be uh, production facilities, right? And um, there will. I'm curious, I mean, that will obviously invert the relationship between who's a kind of a user of it, who's an audience of it, who's, um, who's yeah. a specialist, who's not a specialist. Um, again, I think it's something that might change over yeah. the 10 years, but um, the way that I am trying to describe this to people um, you know, potential collaborators and also internally, because of course it's massively, you know, on one level it's sort of, you know, for the institutions, it's lovely because it's they get this new sexy subject and this yeah. sort of bright, shiny project, and that's all great. But, of course, it's massively threatening on the level of the fact it tips everything on its head. And it says, I mean, if you think typically exhibitions and permanent galleries sit at the top of the pyramid institutionally and learning and publishing mm -hmm. and live mm -hmm. events and performance are these sort of complementary activities. And this is sort of saying, look, these are all forms that we can curate. And actually, it's about the editorial group taking the issues at hand within a season and saying, well, this is a book, and this is a debate, and this is a TV program, and this is an exhibition. So it's a quite a, you know, for a music, you know, everyone's, you know, particularly now in the UK with government cuts, it's like everyone's looking around going, how do I fit into this new world order? But also, how does that actually operate? Well, you know, that's not very institutional way of doing sure, things. Yeah. And equally, you know, uh, the way that I'd, I'm describing it is saying, well, look, you know, there are three strands of the program. And one is Die Hard, NMSI, National Museums of Science and Industry, core research, core collections, the things we would do whether nobody came through the doors or not. Yeah. And then there's this bit in the middle which is partnerships. It's us plus a social enterprise, us plus a teaching institution or research culture, us plus a um, media company, what we do together in the space which neither of us would do independent of each other. So again, this, this really key thing which is this promise, which I can't tell you exactly how it will play out beyond the first couple of years, which is what we do together is the most important thing and what we choose to host within this space is the most important thing and then the final thing is just hosting so when something exists in the real world which we think isn't kind of um lost in translation mm -hmm. if we simply just make it happen in the space what i don't want is people like you and Stuart sort of in the space like the performing seals at the right. zoo like right. come and see the right. interesting designers right. at work it's got to be a little bit more than that which is which is a way that, well, uh, it's a that fits more clearly, more simply within an institutional framework, which is to take some sort of process and and uh, display it happening, rather than uh, taking a situation in a institution. I mean, in an yeah. institution particularly because it's uh, because it gives you the frame and the kind of elevated podium to to make whatever you're doing a bit more resonant, maybe? I hope so, rather yeah. than, um, you know, you saw it go badly wrong when Tate Modern opened, yeah. where everyone who was invited to give a lecture, it was like the high point of their life. And so you right. had the most impenetrable, turgid, awful, you know, things which weren't really part of the... Pr like, we don't want that either. Right, but right. luckily, nobody's got any expectations of what right. we're about to <laughs> do. <Sure. so. laughs> sure. I don't think anyone's going to overperform. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, our red light has come on. We'll take some questions now, um, but make sure that um, you have a mic in hand when you uh, ask your question. Mm -hmm. 
I think we need a mic. I think there's a, oh, there we go. Would you would you um, describe the media space project that you're working on as a kind of like a scientific a recognition of the science of art, like studying the evolution of creativity and like using a scientific method of art in a way? Um, I don't know because uh, science means lots of different things to lots of different people. I guess like art, um, I would call it creative technologies. Um, that's the that's the theme that we're, the Science Museum, the National Media Museum, is happy to address, feel that they can both address quite successfully. There's a really great statistic, which is the Science Museum: 97% of its visitors don't consider themselves specialists in science, and still go. Like the three million people who go. So, um, if you're like me, you know, I'm slightly terrified of the word science. Oh, I mean, like, um, <laughs> you know, like. It's just like the natural, the natural, like just being inquisitive. Like that's just the nature of science. It's just you know, figuring out what's happening and becoming aware of it, and then just yeah. using it. You know. So I'm saying like, you're just trying to figure out really what's ch the changes in the field, like what people are doing, how things are happening, and just kind of trying to bring it to consciousness in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And also thinking of it as a process rather than a sort of fixed, a fixed thing, i.e., a photographic print or a sort of final form mm -hmm. that actually. Um, you know, there's just as much exploration in terms of things like coding of software or, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the designing hardware as there is about this this kind of more sort of contemporary art definition of photography. I mean, I think, it, the, uh, just to jump in for one second, the, the context of a science museum where 97% of the audience, of course, is not a specialist. Um, to situate your project in there, which has a, a which um, which is for generalists anyway, and it actually exploits yeah. that kind of um, tendency of of someone interested in one thing to dabble in something else and to move into yeah. something else, and that actually produces uh, a new kind of knowledge. That I, I think that's particularly exciting, and yeah. you can see that in a lot of you know. You say you got into photography, or that photography became a bit of an accidental subject. Yeah. I think that restlessness um, uh, works quite well to try to under uncover what what's happening in media yep. in general right now. Totally. Um, I mean, if it, it kind of feels in my in my little sort of romantic yeah. head about the the about history, I'd say that the the thing that attracted me to photography with the stories of, you know, in the 60s and 70s when it wasn't a subject, mm. that you had to come from somewhere else to be invested right, right, in right, this right, thing. Right, and the right. community formed as this kind of really interesting group, pluralistic by its mm. very nature group. And I think that media, for me, offers that sort mm. of sense mm. of being, it, you know, if you give up being the specialist, then you can participate actually in this really animated and liberated yeah. new community. Mm. Thank you both for a really interesting conversation. Um, I'm also curious about Media Center and this notion about producers and users and breaking down of boundaries. So sort of an, an obvious question, um, maybe so obvious that it hasn't really come up yet, is <laughs> how um, audiences will be able to participate who aren't necessarily physically present in London, and yeah. so I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more about how you will be sort of disseminating some of the experimentation, um, what yeah. will be happening in terms of um, yeah, spaces outside of London, and yeah. then maybe also to hear you both talk a little bit about print-based culture and digital culture as forms of production and dissemination. Um, well, really quickly, um, there's, there's some people in this room who will definitely be involved in <laughs> what happens outside of the physical space. But um, actually, that's, go that's going terrifically well. I mean, I think Words Without Pictures gave me a lot of um, confidence that you know it doesn't have to be super expensive. It's really about just kind of getting something going. But what, what I would really like to see within the next three years is, is that we've created a framework which acts as an online host for all the things we want to say and archive about this amazing moment. and. Um, I am talking to some people at the moment who I just who know how to do this, you know, who've worked on sort of parallel projects and other areas of culture. So, um, 
I'm really sensitive to the fact that you d there's very specific things, increasingly specific things that you do in physical space, but you know, the, you know, the online space is 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 probably larger and you know as meaningful, but it has to be sort of specific. Whatever you do has to be specifically tailored. What I don't want to end up doing is projects where it's simply about sort of default, you know, online archive because you know. That's easier than a physical archive. Um, with the just to, with the question about um, uh, digital versus sort of printed matter, printed material. I should say the other project that um, David and I worked on when I was at LATMA was actually this really beautiful, rarefied collaboration with the artist Shannon Ebner in this artist book, the print run of a thousand, called The Sun as Error. So I mean I think uh, I think we're both excessively platform sensitive, aren't we? But yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean those are th and those are two kind of extremes. Shannon, the book with Shannon Ebner was a um, lavishly produced um, and also produced in a kind of generous context of having a, a over a year to uh, have conversations and develop this book very slowly with kind of. Um, generous institutional support and that kind of thing doesn't often happen and that's actually the thing that that arrived that at a form so I think you know you ask about digital versus print as kind of forms of production I think the production parts the key part for me which is uh, I mean I'm less interested in this case I'm less interested in the distribution part of either one of those because <laughs> print circulates it's hard to get those books where they need to go these days and increasingly increasingly hard the economics are difficult the Distribution networks are difficult, et cetera. So um, rather than talk about the distribution, these things, both any of these platforms kind of offer their own frames for production. So a book is a thing, is a format that you know how it exists in the world. And so the, the work that you're doing for a year, whether it's talking, whether in the case of the Sun is Error, the book um, with Shannon, Shannon Ebner's book uh, that I made together with Stuart Bailey, um, that offered a form to work a series of conversations and um, to uh, for Shannon to organize her work towards. Um, in the case of uh, well, in the case of print, it, it's uh, that form has a nice quality to it, which it has a deadline. It goes to print, and it also has a format that we that's been solidified over 500 years, so we know where to file it in the <laughs> world, and that's also a good thing. Uh, digital, you know, digital. Like, what does that even? Don't know what that means, but uh, electronic forms uh, resist that urge to form themselves at least at one minute. But they offer up a series of kind of discrete ways to think through issues as well. And so something like the Amazon singles, I think, that are being published, that are just uh, being offered now, kind of five thousand word non creative non fiction pieces, of basically New Yorker pieces channeled through the Kindle. You know, here's a form that emerges from a digital technology, sure, but then it, it just like a New Yorker piece, you know, you, there's kind of a, you know, um, a certain length. And, well, I mean, I'm speaking broadly and without any particular knowledge, but <laughs> but um, but anyway, there's a you, you know that to exist as a kind of way of writing, and so you can write towards that or not. Right. And so these singles right. are something that evolve out of a digital culture, but then they give a form that you can write to. And I think those those forms for production are what or what's a useful way of thinking about this? A website offers another form, or Words Without Picture offered a Words Without Pictures offered a kind of serialized essay form. One person, one month, you write an essay that will be talked about with a set of discussions. Discussions offer a second form, and you you know these were commissioned responses, and so they were serious, thoughtful responses, but they were still kind of couched in the language and rhetoric of a kind of discussion board in some way. Yeah, um, I should add that. Um uh, look out in September this year. Um, I'm working actually with uh, designers that David knows well, Jörg Lenny and Alex Rich, to create a website which will be called eitherand.org because I think it is an either and moment rather than an either or. It's not one thing or another. It can be both analog and digital. So we'll have time for one more question in the front. Well, I, quick, um, I, this is a really informative, but I, I want to ask you um, a question about what you take the force of a remark like, which one hears often, but a reminder of how many photographs are not art photography. I mean, like, you know, I suppose I'm a scholar of poetry, 
and I've been working on poetry for the last 10 years, and then it occurs to me to say, or to notice, what's obviously true, which is that like the vast um, proportion of the number of words used mm. are like not poems. Yeah. Um, and so why it wouldn't follow for me then to say, so you know, I think that in the next 10 years, it's gonna be like those other words that are the things, as opposed to the I poems. I don't think so. You know, it'd be sort I of more so. I wanna say, well, yeah, but I'm interested in the ones that are used as poems. So yeah. I, I totally take the point that, you know, there's an interest in, in photography in general, but it does seem like, the interest in art photography is not an interest in photography as such. No. It's rather an interest in producing certain kinds of artifacts yeah. that precisely do belong to the history of art. And they, of course, also belong to the history of photography, just as like poems also belong to the history of language. But there's not, I mean, I don't quite feel the force of saying, I don't feel the force of the reminder that lots of photographs aren't art. Um, well, I, actually, that was the point for me, which is, is that photography as contemporary art is an extremely specific thing. So that's in relation to the fact that the empirical mass of photographic production is not about art, and it's not about a physical print, and it's not about art history. So I don't think it's a powerful punch, but I think it's, you know, the biggest ring on the onion. Well, thank you, Charlotte, and thank you, David, for the wonderful um, presentation. Thank you.